We will now hear about developing evidence-based reading interventions, insights from deaf children. And speaking to us about this, coming from University College London, is the director of the UCL Deafness Cognition and Language Research Centre, also the leader of the Visual Communication Research Group at the UCL Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience. So please welcome Professor Mairead McSweeney. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa, and thank you for inviting me to the organisers. Um, I have to say that the organisers are much better with their timekeeping than I am. Uh, and they, I was invited to come to this event over a year ago. And then I started to email uh, Ingla and Ava and say to send me more details of when it would start, when it would finish, so that I could uh, book my flight. And then eventually one of them cottoned on and said, no, it's April 2019, not April 2018. I thought that, that, I, thought that I was coming like last year. So uh, you're much more organized with your time than, than I am, I have to say. Um, so like Linda, I also have changed my title from what I submitted uh, a while ago and have gone for something more focused, I hope. And following on from Eric's talk, I will be talking about this attempt to make this leap from basic science to developing interventions uh, for children, in this case, deaf children. Okay, so many of you might not have thought about deafness very much before. Um, and if you haven't, it might come as a surprise to you to learn that deaf children typically find it quite difficult to learn to read. And this is despite the fact that deaf children have a typical nonverbal IQ distribution. Um, but despite this, the average reading age of a deaf child, age 16, leaving school, is somewhere around 11 years old. And we know that poor literacy affects education, employment, well-being, and mental health. So poor literacy generally has a huge cost to society. So talking about deafness and literacy is a, is a huge area. I'm going to be focusing today on single word reading, so this very first step into, into reading. So not really reading comprehension, but single word reading. And the literature is huge, and so I don't possibly have time to, to cover all of that. But there are many different factors that predict reading proficiency in deaf children. And what I'm going to focus on today is lip reading, so speech reading. And there's lots of growing evidence suggesting that speech reading uh, plays a role in reading development in deaf children. So there are numerous studies showing positive correlations between speech reading and reading in deaf children and adults. And just as an aside, I, t I will be using the term speech reading here synonymous with lip reading, but we typically use it to refer to... to, to we, we typically use it in the literature as opposed to lip reading because, of course, we get more from the face and the throat when we look at a face speaking, not just looking at the lips. So here I'm talking about silent visual speech when I talk about speech reading. So there's numerous data sets showing correlations between um, reading and, and speech reading in deaf children. So these are just, this is just one data set of ours from deaf children showing a positive correlation between speech reading ability here on the bottom and single word reading. Um, and again, just to be clear, Reading is, of course, a really complicated um, uh, thing to learn. And here I am just focusing on, in this talk, I'm just focusing on single word reading and the relationship with speech reading. So I am, I am not in any way saying that language more broadly is, uh, is not relevant here. And in this study, we, were, we highlighted the relevance of vocabulary and correlations, long-term correlations with single word reading. Um, but that's part of a much, much broader talk. And I'm, much of my work has, does focus on the role of, for example, sign language and language development in deaf children. I'm very happy to talk about that later. But now I'm just focusing on this relationship between speech reading and single word reading. I do tend to 
say that about 10 times through the talk, because people at the end still say, but you didn't say anything about language. No, I'm just focusing here on this very simple relationship. Because there is lots of evidence, as I've said, suggesting this, there is this relationship between speech reading and reading in deaf children. What might be the mechanism underlying this relationship? If we can understand that mechanism, then perhaps we can harness this relationship uh, to increase deaf children's chances of taking a successful step in this early first step into single word reading. So what might be underpinning this relationship between speech reading and single word reading? Well, it could be a lexical route, so that by improving speech reading ability, what deaf children are doing is establishing their vocabulary, and that this is helping their uh, single word reading. And, or, it could also be a, a sublexical route, such that in deaf children are developing their visual speech processing uh, skills, then they are developing their phonological awareness of spoken language. So, of course, for a deaf child, I'm talking here about children who are born severely or profoundly deaf. So for that group of deaf children, one of their main sources about the structure of a spoken word will be from visual speech and, of course, then from whatever auditory input, residual auditory input they also have, uh, or from their implant or from their cochlear uh, or from their hearing aids as well. But visual speech will form a very major part of, their, of informing them about the structure, the sublexical structure of spoken words. So, one, these are two possible routes by which speech reading could be related to single word reading in children. And this sublexical route has quite a lot of support. So, for example, uh, these are structural equation uh, modeling data from Lizzie Worcester, who has just finished her PhD recently with me, um, from deaf five to six-year-old children. And so, we have various measures of speech reading and of single word reading. These measures are strongly related, as I've already shown you from another data set. And then we also had a measure of phonological awareness in these children. So these are visual judgment tasks. I'll show you some examples of these later. And the important thing here is that when, this, when phonological awareness is added into the model, this relationship between speech reading and reading, which was significant, now becomes non-significant, suggesting that this relationship between speech reading and reading is, is fully mediated, in this case, by phonological awareness in this model. Um, I should point out, though, of course, these are just from con a concurrent data set, so we can't say anything about causality from these data. What we need is longitudinal studies, and there, are, there, there aren't many longitudinal studies at all of deaf children's reading. And in fact, that's going to be one of my conclusions at the end, which is that we really need more longitudinal studies of deaf children's reading to fully understand causality of these many different factors that are involved in deaf children learning to read. There are a handful of studies, and a number of these studies have um, have looked at this relationship between speech reading and reading, and these longitudinal studies have also suggested that phonological awareness plays a mediating role in this relationship between speech reading and reading in deaf children. So the basic idea here then is that deaf children may be able to establish multimodal phonological representations of spoken words, based upon many different modalities. So yes, of course, they will use the residual auditory input that they have access to via their cochlear implant or their um, hearing aids. Um, and they will also make use of other sources of information about the sublexical structure of spoken words. And so where orthography is helpful, they will use this in informing their, their, their understanding of structure of spoken words. Um, of course, when uh, they may be able to use their own artic uh, attempts at articulation to also inform these representations. So words that, so very simply, so when we say chair and bear that rhyme in order to produce those 
rhyming sounds, we have to, of course, make the same speech acts to produce those same speech sounds. Um, and as I've already articulated, one of the main sources of information into these phonological representations for deaf children is likely to be from visual speech, from speech reading. And as I'll point out in the second part of the talk, the information from these other modalities, other than audition, are also likely to be important also for hearing children, not just for deaf children, but these weightings are likely to differ between groups, right? So, of course, for hearing children, they're going to be extremely reliant, predominantly reliant on, the, on auditory input to establish these phonological representations. But as we know from much early infant work, from Janet Worker and others, in regular language develop, spoken language development in hearing children, visual speech plays, plays a, and can play an important role. Okay, so we were interested in what these, if, if deaf people can establish these phonological representations in the absence, I'm going to say absence of extreme, but in, in, with impoverished auditory input, then what might be the neural systems that are, are uh, supporting processing of these phonological representations? So, um, 10 years ago now, that's scary, um, we had deaf and hearing adults who were all good readers uh, in, the, in the scanner, and we asked them to make decisions about whether pictures, English labels for pictures, rhymed or not. So chair, bear, rhyme, and we contrasted this to this low-level task where they just decided whether it was the same picture or not. And when we did this, we see very similar networks engaged in the deaf adults and in the hearing adults making these metalinguistic decisions about rhyme. We did a similar paradigm um, with using ERPs, and this was when I was lucky enough to visit Helen Neville, who we've already heard about this morning from Eric. Um, so I was lucky enough to uh, go for a year and a half to visit Helen uh, Neville and join her brain development lab family and spend a great year and a half there learning from Eric and from Annika Anderson, who many of you uh, here in London know, of course, as well. Uh, and uh, I have to say, so I'm going to be telling you in the second part of this talk about uh, in the intervention study, and I, uh, my, my interest in intervention really came from Helen, and I was crazy enough to follow her into the world of educational interventions, which has been a steep learning curve, to say the least. Um, and so with Helen, we worked again with deaf adults, so we had deaf adults who were good readers, hearing adults who were good readers, and we had them do a word rhyming task in this, in this case. So do these words rhyme, kite, right, with, right? Uh, and what we see in hearing adults is this uh, very well established enhanced negativity to non-rhyming words. And we, say, we see the same pattern in the deaf adults, and although I'm not showing you all the data here, um, this had the same distribution in the deaf and the hearing adults. Critically, this was the case when deaf adults were good at the task. So when deaf people can do the task, then the networks that they're using and the timing within this network seems to be very similar when they're making these decisions about the sublexical structure of spoken words. This is despite the fact that, of course, these representations have to be based on input from different modalities. One group is hearing and one group is, is deaf, and they're making decisions about whether these words rhyme. But they, these data then led us to argue that these representations, if they can be established, and of course there is great variability within deaf children and adults within, with regard to how well they can be established, but if they can be established to a reasonably good level, then these representations may be, pick any of these words that you want to use, amodal, supramodal, multimodal, at some level abstracted away from the, very, uh, from, from, from the modalities in which they are delivered or accessed. Um, to the extent to which, if these representations are similar in the deaf and hearing brains, to put it very simply, then this, we argued, potentially supports further this idea that these 
other mo sources of modality can inform these phonological representations in deaf people, which if these then operate in a similar way in the brain, in deaf and hearing people, these representations may then be able to support early word reading in deaf children in a similar way to that that we see in hearing children. Okay, so that's all of the, the, the background. So we, having established this, this very simple, I won't be brave enough to call it a model, but this very simple box diagram of how speech reading might be related to reading, we then set out to test it, um, the causality of this, in a randomized control trial. So we tested whether we developed games, which I'll show you in a moment, to develop speech reading skills in young deaf children. And then we were testing whether training on these speech reading games lead to gains in speech reading, because many of you that are working in the field will know that whether you can train speech reading or not in deaf children is, is debatable. It's been widely debated in, in the literature. Let me say that again. Whether you can train speech reading in adults has been widely debated. There's actually been very little work in, in training speech reading with children. Um, so can we train speech reading in deaf children? Does this lead to any changes in their phonological representations? And then ultimately, and a really long shot, setting you up for the results here, um, and ultimately, does this then feed through into any gains in single word reading? Okay, so we, in the spirit of open science, we registered this RCT on open science framework, and we had a fun 18 months developing all of our games and collecting data for the algorithms that need to inform these adaptive games. So I'm not going to bore you with, with all of the details, but we developed a whole suite of games that had a reward structure and so on, and I'm going to give you some examples. So here you'll see somebody say a word in the box, and then you have to decide which of the items at the bottom he said. We could make these adaptive because we, some words are much easier to lip read than others. And we also could make them adaptive by the target word either being visually, as in on the lips, close to the, the other options, the distractors, or very different. This will be Make, be clear when you see it. So this first one is supposed to be an easy one. Let's see what you think. Anybody get that? Helicopter. Helicopter doesn't have many competitors in terms of speech reading. Whereas this is a more difficult one. Didn't like that, definitely wasn't that. Any ideas quickly? Matt. It was Matt, he liked that one. So we had adapt these games that could be adapted in various ways. We also had the children do it the other way around where they saw a picture and then they had to choose which speech act went with the picture. So they had to then imagine the speech and choose the video. So that looked like this. Okay. And then we also then moved them on to looking at letters and trying to match the speech to letters and introducing some ideas of segmenting and blending. So like a very early phonics skills, which look like this. Okay. So you get the idea. There was all kind. There's a whole suite of these types of games, um, and so. We had a bunch of deaf children, I'll tell you about them in a minute, pre-intervention assessments, and then we split them into two arms, the speech reading training, uh, and also then a control, situa a control arm where they did the same games but did maths games. So same environment, but they just worked with numbers, didn't see any visual speech. There we go. Uh, and so 
Very limited training, really. 10 minutes a day on these computerized games, four days a week, 12 weeks. Then we went back and saw them afterwards, and then we went back three months later. So this whole thing took an academic year, really, from, from October through to, to July. OK, so our children. In order to find 66 children, deaf children who were five to seven years old, severely or profoundly deaf before the age of 12 months, we had to go all around England. Uh, to find these children, so all up, up to Newcastle and, and out to the, uh, out, all, the whole length of England to find these children. Um, they, some half had cochlear implants, um, uh, many of them used uh, some form of sign language in the classroom. They were a very mixed group. I'm going to be telling you today, just in the summary, just about data from the 20 in each group. So we had 33 in each arm. Unfortunately, only 20 in each group completed 85% or more of the training. And so we learned a lot about uh, fidelity and getting uh, computerized interventions to work across 33 schools, where you're working with very difficult firewall situations and failing infrastructure and all kinds of things. So. We, uh, we learned a lot through that. OK, so what did we find? So our question is, did the children in the speech reading group improve on speech reading more than the kids in the maths group? Of course, all of these analyses that I'm going to show you are when we're controlling per per performance at time one, so performing for baseline performance. So one of our speech reading measures was uh, where they saw a sentence like this, and they had to repeat back in sign or speech what the person had said. So you, here's another speech reading test for you. So see, this is a question, of an everyday question, and see if you can see what she's going to say. Any idea? How old are you? Very good. Ten points. Um, OK, so on that kind of test, um, we saw a significant effect of training at time three. So just to remind you, time one is before training, time two is after training, time three is three months after training. So three months after the end of the, the training, then we see significant gains in speech reading in the speech reading group compared to the maths group with a, a pretty big effect size. So we were pleased with that. So we, we did see effects on speech reading. What about on phonological representations? Well, we see a trend in the right direction here. Oh, sorry, I'll tell you what the task is. So here we see um, the person, here's the target. They have to decide which of these words rhymes with the target. When we did our training, when we did our um, uh, uh, picture naming, uh, to establish all of these pictures for our training, we had a bar of soap. And at the time, no children knew what a bar of soap was. We had to come up with the squirty soap so that children would identify this as soap. But as I watched Greta on the news last night, I was thinking, well, we're going to probably revert the other way now, because we're all going back to bars of soap, right, away from the plastic squeezy bottles. So we will probably have to redo some of our pictures in order to, uh, for the next generation of children who will only know bars of soap. Um, so soap and rope rhyme. So we see a trend in the right direction, but, but this was not significant, but a small effect size here. Um, another way of looking at, that was an explicit task, another way of looking at phonological representations is to look at speech output of these deaf children. So at each time point, we had them name a bunch of pictures, of all the pictures that were involved in these tasks, and in collaboration with a the speech language therapist, Rachel Reese at UCL, we scored their speech output in terms of both auditory quality and visual quality. So even if they weren't voicing, they were getting some uh, credit for the quality of their speech output, even if they weren't voicing. And using this system, then uh, this scoring system, then again at time three, we see this a significant uh, effect uh, at time three of improvements, greater improvements in the speech reading group than in the maths group. And again, this isn't taking into account any differences at time one. Um, it is significant, but the effects, it's a small effect size. So there's a hint of something going on in terms of phonology. What about in terms of reading? Well, we do see improvements in reading over time. 
Um, and, but thankfully, we have a control group that make, allow us to make sensible interpretations of the data, and both of the groups improved over time, uh, which is good, uh, but not so good for our training. So there was no indication that this speech reading training fed through into improvements in single word accuracy. So I'm going to come back to that uh, at the end and interpreting that. Okay, so summary of the deaf data, which is now, I'm happy to say, in press. Um, speech reading representation, sorry, speech reading training led to improvements in speech reading. Some indication of improvement in phonological representations when tested by the speech output measure. No indication of, of an effect on phonological awareness, or at least not significantly, and, and no effect on single word reading. So again, I'm going to come back to interpret this in, in, in a little while. We were also then interested in hearing children. So why were we interested in this? Well, as we were setting up this study and talking to many people about it, it became apparent that this idea, there was this idea was already in the literature that hearing children who struggle with phonological representations may be able to strengthen these representations of spoken words through non-auditory information. So the deaf, sorry, hearing children who are struggling with phonology may be able to boost their, their representations through emphasis on these other sources of input, such as speech reading. Um, when watching Linda's talk this morning, um, I tried to squeeze in a study we have done looking at eye movements during visual speech perception in deaf and hearing children. But when you try to do these things at the last minute, the videos never work and the video didn't work. So I'm, I can't show you the video of that. But we have looked at eye movement tracking during when deaf and hearing children are watching videos of visual speech and shown inc very similar patterns of eye, tr eye movements when deaf and hearing children are looking at a visual sil a silent face talking, which was interesting that these patterns were so similar given the very different communicative experience of these deaf and hearing children. We've also shown um, that this correlation between speech reading and reading accuracy um, here in the dotted line for the deaf children is very similar in hearing children. So hearing children also show this correlation between speech reading and single word reading. Uh, and we've also shown this in adults who are hearing, adults who are dyslexics. We don't have longitudinal data, unfortunately, but again, Lizzie in her PhD looked at a large group of young hearing children and you, again, concurrent data, so it's not longitudinal data, but again, using structural equation modeling, came, you can't see these numbers very well, but take my word for it, the numbers on here are very similar for the hearing children as for what we saw for the deaf children. So when we look at the relationship between speech reading and reading, the relationship is very strong, 0.6 here, but then when we add in phonological awareness, then this relationship becomes non-significant, suggesting that in this model at least, then that this is a good fit to the data, that this relationship is med may be mediated by phonological awareness, even in hearing children. So, how long have I got left? Let's see. Uh, am I doing okay? In okay, so 10 minutes, okay. So Lizzie then attempted to do a small intervention trial to see if we could train speech reading in young hearing children. Seems like a weird thing to do. Why would you want to do that? But of course, our intention was then to see if this had any impact on their phonological awareness. So when we train, when we get deaf children to attend to visual speech, does this lead to any improvements in their phonological awareness? So we just did this as a pilot study, really. So a, a reduced version of the big training study that we did with deaf children. So we had um, 43 in each, in each arm, in each group, and they just did 10 minutes a day for three weeks, five days a week, and the control here was just a business, business as usual control group. So we didn't have the maths control group here. So these are he all hearing children age four to five, so that's the year that you enter school in the UK. We start far too early in the UK, that's kind of well established. So they're four to five-year-olds. Um, and 
we could train speech reading in these young hearing children. So what we so here in the dark bars we have the intervention group and the light grey is the business as usual control group. This is at pretest, this is at post test. So and this is so speech reading, single words accuracy at the side here. And we see improvements in the intervention group, pretest to post test. Uh, and these improvements in the training group were, were maintained three months later. We also showed that this generalized to untrained words. So we have the, um, the here we're looking, importantly, we're only looking at the trained group of children. Okay, so these are only the children that have done the speech reading training. So we've got rid of the, the business as usual control group. So within the kids that have, only, have done the training, then we see improvements on trained words, but we also see improvements on untrained words. And again, this is maintained three months later. So in the kids that did the training, we see improvements on trained words and improvements on untrained words. So that's, that was, this is kind of, it, it, interesting that you can train speech reading in young hearing children uh, and that generalizes to untrained words but importantly does it have any consequences for phonological awareness well no not at the group level that's kind of disappointing um, but there was a tan there's tantalizing uh, effect in the when we look at the, uh, at the at the groups when we so the assumption of uh, uh, lines of slope being equivalent in the two groups, so the essential assumption for this ANCOVA is not, is not met, these slopes are different in the two groups. What this actually means is that the children in the lower half of this plot, who are in the intervention group, make a better, make more improvements at time two than children who are in the control group do at time two. Now, this plot is really unsatisfying because everybody's skewed up here, right? So this whole, it, it, it could be that uh, this, this uh, uh, ceiling effect on both our, our phoneme blending at time one and our phoneme blending at time two is, is, is skewing both lines. It could be that this is masking a main effect. We're not really sure. We need to do this again with better measures that don't have this ceiling effect. But it is tantalizing that, this, um, that, that there is this interaction and that there's something potentially going on with these younger children, young hearing children, and it's the ones who are poor that are benefiting more, which is exactly what we would expect, right? Because it is those young, it's the poor hearing children who are likely to be the ones that need that boost to enhance their phonological representations. Uh, I could witter on, I, I'll say more about that later, perhaps in, in questions. But in, in, in England, and, and anyway, when children enter school, they're drilled, drilled, drilled in phonics, and the, when they enter school, their phonics is very poor, so we did pilot testing in October. They could hardly do any of our tasks. We went back in uh, February, lots of them were at ceiling. So there's a very quick learning curve of phonics, and, it's, and then so we need to think about timing, in terms of timing of when do we, if this is gonna make a difference, when do we catch those kids? But it's going to be those kids that are failing, that aren't getting that really quick boost and getting it really quickly, that may benefit from this, potentially. Okay, did it have any consequences for reading? As you may have guessed by everything, all my waffling, uh, then, then it didn't. Okay, so a summary, what did we see in these two groups then? So in deaf children, we see effects of speech reading training on speech reading, on phonological representations when measured by speech output. And then in hearing children, we see in effects of speech reading training on speech reading. We haven't yet looked at their speech output, but there are, there's a potential indications of improvements in phonological awareness in these young kids who are the poorest performers. Okay, so what does this mean? So, conclusions. Speech reading can be trained in deaf children. It appears to generalize beyond the trained words and beyond trained models. 
There's some evidence of transfer, though perhaps only for the poorest performers, but no evidence of transfer to reading. I'm just, before I move on to thinking about why no transfer, um, I just want to highlight this because actually, I, you know, I, I designed this study around trying to, to look at reading and what can we do to help reading, but actually many people working with deaf children, the speech and language therapists, the teachers that we worked with, are delighted that we have developed a little game that kids seem to enjoy, that you just do for 10 minutes a day, that seems to have some benefits on their speech reading ability. So although I'm interested in how, what else this might do, actually the fact that we have seen some improvements in speech reading is, is positive in itself. And I need not to forget that. So that's more for me than, than for you. Um, Okay, so why no effects on speech reading? And so now I can bring it to your theme of, of, of the conference. And of course, everything has to do with time, which is, uh, as, as, as you know, and that's uh, the, the theme behind your center. So the, to the dosage that we had in this training was extremely low. So for the deaf children, it amounted to, if, if they did the full training, it amounted to eight hours over three months. It's really a drop in the ocean compared to all the other things that these deaf children are doing. For hearing children, it was two and a half hours over three weeks. So really, you know, to get an idea of dose and what's a good dose, we, we, it, it's hard, right? Because there's these, if you overdo it, you can, you can saturate too much and do too much. But what, how do we find out what a good dose is? It's difficult because these studies are difficult to do. Um, and then... Coming back again to something that Linda talked about earlier, about development, <laughs> we're trying to implement these developmental, uh, we're trying to implement these interventions, and we need to get the timing of that intervention right in terms of development. So we selected children based on their chronological age, but as many of you know who work with deaf children or any children from an atypical population or even from a typical population, there is huge vari language variability. Um, there is huge variability, variability, inability, that's quite hard to say, um, at the same chronological age. And so we would be better to be thinking about selecting deciding when exactly this intervention might be beneficial to children and trying to target then the kids that are at that stage in their development, that stage where they are most ready to receive the benefit of speech reading, boosting their phonological representations, for example. I hope that was clear. Um, and also, we know um, from the simple view of reading that as I mentioned right at the beginning, reading is much more than decoding. Reading is, to be a successful reading comprehender, you need to be good at decoding and at language comprehension. And so, although I am focusing here on single word reading, there are reasons to, suggest, to think that language comprehension may be really important for deaf children, even in single word reading development. Because of course, we might be able they might, we may be able to teach them about phonics and, and, and whatever, but unless they can make that link to the lexical item and, to, and then linking that to the object in the world and develop their language more broadly, uh, then, then, then they're not going to make much progress, even with this first step into single word reading. So we know from her work with hearing children that the biggest impacts come from in, combining both decoding and, and language work. And so I think that if potentially we may see greater benefits if we embedded this speech reading training, which is kind of almost phonics training, in a broader literacy program. So linking it to the semantics, bringing in sign, bringing in fingerspelling for those children that use it and so on. It could be also that our model is completely incorrect, that this idea this, that I've been proposing of speech reading, influencing phonological awareness, and then supporting reading is, is incorrect, and that the structural equation model data are perhaps misleading in some way. It could be that it's not acting as a mediator, but as a moderator, meaning that it could be that for the hearing children, you could imagine the situation 
where if you're good at phonological awareness, you've established really good phonological awareness of speech based on sound, then when you see a visual, a face talking, actually you're pretty good at that because your phonological representations of speech are good and therefore you're able to make sense of this uh, other way of accessing speech. And so these things are related because phonological awareness is good through auditory means rather than anything like that. Where, so that makes sense for hearing children. It makes much less sense, I think, for, for deaf children. But I think we, we need to think more broadly about how to explain the fact that we still have these very strong correlations. We have these longitudinal data. We have these, um, the, the structural equation data that I showed you. Um, but yet our training attempt did, wasn't very successful in, in, in training reading. And as I've said, it might just be, well, it was a first attempt and we just need to do more of it or something. Or it might be that something else is going on and we've just been blinded by the, 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 the correlational data, the structural equation data that I've shown you. And we need to think more broadly about it. One thing that might be going on is that the speech reading reading relationship may be based on, not on phonology, but on other aspects of speech. So it's very likely um, that deaf children maybe are, well, I'll put it more simply, that we're trained, we're, we're, that focusing on phonology and focusing down on the single phonemes, so put egg, like I showed you in some of the games that they played, um, is just the wrong level. That's not what we should be focusing on. Maybe we should be focusing more on the rhythms of connected visual speech um, or on morphology in visual speech on, on bigger units either within words or across connected speech. So looking at um, yeah, so rhythm and connected speech. and what, So that would be another basic science approach to bring in. So looking at what are deaf children in training to in, in connected visual speech and also in potentially in single visual speech lexical items as well. Okay, so future plans. So in order to do all this, I really do think we need to, we need, long, we need longitudinal data from deaf children. I think much of the data in the world of reading and deafness comes from deaf adults, which is really frustrating because people try to then make conclusions about deaf children from deaf adults. I'm guilty of that. The neuroimaging data that I showed you is from deaf adults. Um, but working with deaf children is very difficult. We have to go all around the country to find these kids and they're spread out across all these different schools. So it, it's challenging, but I think we really do need to make progress in this area. We need longitudinal data from deaf children, measuring a wide range of reading related skills to better understand causality. Um, and in order to do that, then we need a cross site collaborations, I think, in order to get the numbers. In terms of neuroimaging, then um, one thing that I, in responding to, to questions that Lisa sent around about future plans and future thoughts, I think one big issue that, for, that I am grappling with a lot is what do I really mean what, by representation? I've talked a lot about representations. Um, we all talk a lot about representations. What do we really mean, I think, is going to be one of the big questions for the future. I made the argument that this similarity in the networks engaged and the timing of those networks between deaf and hearing people making rhyme decisions supports the notion that what's going on in the brain when they're making these decisions is similar. And the inference from that that I made is that the representations that are being operated upon are also similar. That's a massive assumption. That's a, that's a big step from showing no significant difference between two data sets from a deaf group and a hearing group. And so what we're doing now is trying to actually test this, these hypotheses directly using representational similarity analysis. So some of you may have used this. So these are multivariate analyses um, allowing us to actually test the similarity of patterns of activation in different groups or in different, uh, uh, in response to different inputs. So what I want to do, what I would love to be able to do, and we, we, we collected the data, we're just starting to analyze the data, is to address this question of really whether these representations of speech in deaf and hearing people really are modality specific, 
So if they're based mainly on visual input in deaf people, then they're totally different to those based on auditory input in hearing people. Or is there some substance to this amodal, supramodal idea that I talked to you about at the beginning of my talk? So to address that, we have hearing people listening to spoken non-words, no semantics, so spoken non-words in the scanner, and then deaf people watching these non-words being spoken, and we are at the hypothesis for this strong hypothesis for this strong uh, uh, hypothesis here would be that these representations may be very similar in deaf and in hearing people for these non-words even though they're based on very different inputs. That's very optimistic, but that was, that's the kind of the long view of, of, of what, what we're trying to do, and that's what I think we need to address in the future, looking at representations. Okay, so I'd like to finish by thanking all of the schools and all of the participants uh, involved in those studies, and then everybody involved uh, in these, in all the collaborators and all my group, and especially Hannah Pimpton and Lizzie Worcester, who were the two people who led the intervention studies. Thank you very much.